away from that now. Malala Yousafzai, who was shot in the head by Taliban gunmen eight years ago as she campaigned for girls' rights to education, is now an Oxford University graduate. The Pakistani-born activist, now 22, this week completed her degree in philosophy, politics and ec economics at England's prestigious University of Oxford. Hard to express my joy and gratitude right now, Yusuf Zay tweeted on Friday. I don't know what's ahead for now. It will be Netflix, reading, and sleep, end of quote. Yusuf Zay, who won a Nobel Peace Prize in 2014 for her fight against the suppression of children, also shared two photographs of her. Joining us live is Shirin No, who is a psychotherapist and also a Pakistani. Good morning, Shirin. Can you hear me, Shireen? Are you there? Do we have her yet? Hi, Hello. Shireen. Yes, I can hear that you're there. That's why I, I took a pause. How are you? All good right, morning. Okay. I'm good, thank you. Thank it's you a bit strange doing this through Zoom, so yeah, but all I'm right. good, thank you. Thank you. I mean, we are all, it's an exciting news. Congratulations to Malala. Me, as we uh, will say, is she as much a role model in Pakistan as she is a global one? Uh, well, this question, this answer is not that straightforward, I have to say. Um, because there are certain very select circle, a niche group, I would call them the educated elite in Pakistan, who do consider her as a role model. But then there, there is the average Pakistani, like the middle class, and even sometimes even the upper middle class, uh, where they have these perceptions that she has been funded by foreign agencies. And there's some strange conspiracy theories around this whole incident, hmm. I mean, which is very unfortunate. So I would say that the, really the short answer to the question is that the average Pakistani does not consider her as a role model, hmm. which is very sad. Mm, I agree with you. Now, how commonplace is it to have a Pakistani-born activist uh, such as Malala? Or do you feel her family played a significant role in the person that she is now? Mm. Uh, well, sort of, there are other activists besides Malala. Um, there are Pakistani-born activists who live in outside Pakistan as well, who are Pakistani origin, but they don't live in the country. But then there is, there is a great number, a large number of activists who are born in Pakistan, who are bred in Pakistan, and they live in Pakistan, and these are female activists. Hmm. Uh, but I think they have become activists through the context of their family. So for Malala, I would say it is definitely her family, namely her father, who was a teacher himself, an educationist, and he was an, a sort of a mm -hmm. speaker for female education. And I think he has played a very significant role in her becoming an activist and even encouraging her to speak out for female education. Mm. Very important that you brought that uh, aspect uh, for us. Now, how mm. will the courage Malala uh, has shown in the face of what could have been a tragedy transformed the face of education and activism for women in Pakistan and the world also? Mm. I think what we see in the West, a lot of countries in the West, I mean, it's taken really for granted, yes, that girls will go to school. Uh, the girls that will go to higher education get university degrees. Uh, and that is quite a lot that happens, and that's what we see. But there's a lot of stuff that is hidden that Malala obviously has brought out in the open that we didn't know, like most girls who miss out on secondary and higher education. <laughs> and countries like Afghanistan, even Brazil, there's India, there's Pakistan, there's Nigeria and Lebanon and Turkey. So some countries that I'm naming, some of them. And by Malala actually speaking out, she's actually created a platform where she's actually empowered women and girls really to have a voice and demand rightfully what is basically a very human right, based, basic human right to education. And in really, in Malala's words, uh, she says that she believes that she will see every girl in school in her lifetime. So that's quite incredible for her to mm -hmm. openly say that. Mm -hmm. All right. What more do you feel needs to be done, you know, in terms of activism, activism rather, for the advancement of women's rights uh, the world over? 
you see this we have got malala who has spoken out for female education but then we also have greta thunberg a very young girl again who is speaking out for you know the environment and trying to make and these two girls i would say girls are women because they're still very young you know and malala they've both started off very young and they've actually created this positive change in the world and they've actually created the platform where they they're empowering not just women and girls but also the the common common man common woman and girl and boy mm-hmm. to find their voice and demand something that was denied yeah which is for changes to be made and if you think about malala she's this girl from a village in rural pakistan and if she can speak openly about the rights of a girl to get an education she's actually the voice or she's actually speaking out for all the girls who have been denied this very basic right of doing this mm. so she's not even actually just even creating awareness i would say but she's taking action to physically build the schools and she's actually challenging world leaders mm. she's asking them if i can do it if a, if a young girl in who was 15 can do it at that time when she started uh why can't you and i believe that all of us can actually take courage and learn from girls like malala and greta to actively speak out and empower one another to find their voices and demand the world leaders to make the change that uh, is needed all right shirin before i let you go if i may ask you personally in what way does malala's story resonate with you as a pakistani woman I think I'm very proud of her I have to say um because with me uh like I I get went back to education at a late age and she's actually stood up and she's talked about female education and girls getting education and I think it is very important that girls do get an education because they are able to stand up for themselves be independent and not be controlled by culture and religion and what is said to them so I think it does resonate a lot with me because I have a daughter and I'm educating her and I've encouraged her to go to university and be independent so yes in that way yes there there is a res- residence there and I'm actually quite proud to be you know called a Pakistani and proud to say that Malala is from Pakistan Congratulations are in order for Malala and of course by extension to Thank you too. Thank you so very much Shireen for being with Thank us and sharing so your much. thoughts. All right. All right, thanks. All right, and Bye. still on this issue and bringing it back home in Nigeria, we have um some other people. We have Chinenye Mba Uzoku, who is an education consultant. And also joining us live is Grace Amoka, educator and fellow with Teach for Nigeria. Both of them are speaking to us uh, virtually. Good morning, Chinenye. Good morning. Thank you for being with us. Now let's begin with you. Uh, let's start with the good news. How much significant is it that we have a young lady like Malala uh, celebrating a landmark such as her graduating from the prestigious Oxford uh, University after her ordeal? Uh, I don't know. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm, I'm actually speechless. My my voice is just thick from emotion. I think it's just um, it's just incredible, absolutely incredible. I mean, it's just it's not just the the fact that she's graduated, but but the symbolism um, that it holds for everyone, uh, not just girls, particularly girls, but but just for young children all over the world who desire an education and for various reasons are unable to access that education. I just I mean I was so excited when I when I heard about it when I read about it. I was excited. I saw Netflix and I said, "Oh wow, she's going to be in a movie." And I was like looking forward to <laughs> seeing her as you know, a superstar in uh, in one of these movies. Um I was just telling her story. Her story is just an incredible story. Mm-hmm. And everything to her and to her family and to the people of Pakistan for lending us this incredibly important human story that yeah. helps and motivates all of us to be better than ourselves. I, I think it's just incredible. Thank you very much to her. <laughs> it is Shirin, incredible course, indeed. Yeah. <laughs> it is incredible. Yeah. All right, yeah. let's move to it's Grace amazing. also, uh, who is who is online. Grace, thank you for joining <laughs> us this morning. Thank you very much for having me. Good morning. Good morning. Now, why should Malala's uh, achievements resonate with young women and those deprived uh, deprived rather of a quality education in Nigeria and across the world? Yes. So one of the things that I remember her saying is the reason she shares her story is not necessarily because it's unique, but because it's the same story as over 130 million girls around the world 
So it's the same story of, um, you know, coming from underserved communities where education is not given priority. It's the story of early child marriage. Mm -hmm. And so it, for me, it's very inspirational. You know, these young girls from these communities knowing that if someone like them could surmount the hurdles that she faced, near impossible situations to come out from, then they too. So for me, it's, it's a story of inspiration and hope. Mm -hmm. Hope that um, education and the quest for education can do so much in transforming the lives of people. So it's for me, another thing that it, it um, does for me is it reminds us that leadership is not about position. And in the various places that we find ourselves, we can actually make change happen. And that's what leadership is about. It's about service. It's, it's about finding a problem and preferring solutions to it. So for me, it's really remarkable mm -hmm. for young girls all over the world and even older people, you know, to know that if someone this young could make such change around the world, then there's no excuse that we have. Absolutely. L let me hear your thoughts, uh, Chinenye. You know, given the challenges of education, uh, in comparison now uh, with our own education system in Nigeria, what are your thoughts as regards our inability to continue, for instance, online education in our public universities, even at this time that it would just seem as the best and the right thing to do? Well, I, I need like two days on this topic to kind of like unpack it. But, you know, in, in summary, the, the, I think the, the, the question really that faces us is very simple. What are the options that we have? If we assume that we have 40 million children in school and we assume a class size pre-COVID of 40, it means we needed a million classrooms, just back of the envelope calculations. We needed 1 million classrooms in order to send every single child who needed to be in school to school. Post-COVID, those classrooms that were designed for 40 people are probably now going to only, only be able to take 20 children. If it's 20 children, then it means we double the number of classrooms that we require. We are never going to build those number of classrooms. Mm -hmm. In the universities that we're talking about today, people are 300, 400 in the clinics. Lecturers have a challenge of, of marking scripts for 400 students in some courses. They will never do that. They won't do term papers. They won't do seminar papers. They just cannot possibly cope with that number. The only way that we can address this issue of scaling education rapidly to reach as many people as possible is by introducing, massively introducing technology. And it's not going to be easy. And some people will be left behind. There is absolutely no, this is the brutal truth. We just cannot cope with the numbers that we have. And we're coming from a backlog of over three, almost four decades of, 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 of a disaster in the educational landscape. We didn't, we had problems before COVID, those problems have been exacerbated, yeah. but curiously, within COVID itself has come the solutions. I mean, states are teaching using WhatsApp. Radio has become, a, a, a Lagos state is taking a radio license to teach. Mm -hmm. Their TV stations are donating time. The telecoms companies are giving free data, zero-based data for, um, for, for education. These things, are, the, the states have dropped the right of way charges to zero. All these things uh, happened in the last three months as a result of a response to the COVID, in the COVID, uh, COVID pandemic. Mm -hmm. The big question facing us is why ASU, not the lecturers, because I make a clear distinction between ASU as a union and lecturers who want to teach right. and who desire to teach. The union says no, but you can't tell me that lecturers are not willing to, because I know them. Even my, my, my colleagues in the computer science profession, everybody knows there is no alternative to online learning. Are we ready now? No. But this mandate existed and this requirement existed before COVID. And now that the children are unable to come to schools, there is no alternative. Hmm. And anyone who says no should present the alternative. What is the alternative? Are you gonna take them back into those classrooms the way that they were before? Are you gonna take them in, in the numbers that they were in before, three, 400 children in one single room? trying mm. to learn something in a blackboard. These, these things are just reality. Mm. So the, 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 what, what we expect the, 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 the ASU to do on behalf of the academics is to sit with the authorities, present us with a Marshall Plan, the equivalent of a huge recovery plan that enables not just those who are out of school, but the millions who do not get admitted. I mean, every year, about 1.7 to 1.9 people take CHAMP. 
the carrying capacity of our universities for admission is between 500 and 600,000, mm. which means that even if all of them were able to go into university, they just can't take them. Many are dropped for the simple reason that they cannot get into university. There's not enough spaces in the universities. Now, the total enrollment of all universities in Nigeria, 167 of them is 1.9 million. That's, that's about 1% of our population. We cannot develop in that manner. There is simply no way that you can scale the conventional universities to the, to the requirements and aspirations of our country. And given COVID, there is absolutely no alternative but to dramatically improve on the access to technology and the skills we get to teach um, through online uh, pedagogy. Mm. That should be our focus. And I would rather that Asu was saying, let's do this. And here's what we need to get it done. Right. Than to say, no, we can't do this. It just doesn't make uh, the slightest bit of sense. And it's grossly unfair to the children. Right. Um, I don't know. I, I see education like health. If you deny children mm -hmm. of education, it's the same thing as denying them access to health care. Right. And if the resident mm -hmm. doctors have been able to answer to the demands by stepping back, then definitely ASU, under the current circumstances of a pandemic, has no business keeping schools locked up and withdrawing their, their staff from the most critical function of educating our children. All right, let, me take, let me take uh, Chinenya's uh, thoughts also. I mean, as someone um, who is always... Do we have, do we have Chinenya there? Hello, Chinaya. Yes, Chinaya just spoke. <laughs> I think she is there. Chinaya, if you can hear me, as someone who is, uh, who is an educator, you come in contact with uh, students all the time. What will it take to empower our students at this time? I mean, where do we start? Okay, I, I think you meant Grace, not Chinenya. Oh, Grace, I apologize completely. Yes. <laughs> yes. I, for, I, for, I forgive you too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chinenya, okay. for forgiving so me. I, I, Grace, that question is yours. <laughs> yes. All right. I think I'll just I'll just um, take up from where he stopped. Okay. The realities that are facing us started before COVID. COVID just exposed the um, the breakdown of our education system. I, I work in an underserved community in Kaduna State, and we have well over 100 students in a classroom, in a tiny classroom. So those are the kinds of realities that we're faced with. We have well over 13 million children, not even in school. So what do we do to empower students You know, in a time like this? I would say it requires concerted efforts by every stakeholder in the education space. So while the government is doing all the things that Mr. Chinenia has suggested, I believe that as young people, as people in the media, as you're doing, we need to start to have conversations around this. What can we do? Not, oh, there's nothing that can be done. So I have some of my colleagues, for example, that have launched online platforms to ensure that teachers have the required skills that they need to start online teaching. Because it's not a, we, we don't have an option right now. Technology is the solution for um, the future of education in our country. And education is so important, even um, in affecting what our health system looks like. So in, rather than saying we cannot do this, we need to start to ask, how can I, in my own space, make sure that learning continues? We have teachers that have gone out of their ways to drop paper packets, you know, the drop of worksheets for these children to continue learning. As little as these efforts are, I think it's it's very comforting to me to know that people are thinking of the future of their country. They're thinking of, oh, what can I do for my country rather than waiting for the government? Because the truth is we have waited for the government for too long. And I say it all the time, the generation before my generation has failed us. So rather than waiting for, for things to happen, I ask myself and I ask the people around me, what do you think we can do? I have a friend who put together um, a, a, a funding project to make sure that the children in these low income communities get tablets, computers, to make sure that they are learning. So these are things that as, as um, concerned Nigerian citizens we can do. What Plus TV Africa is doing in engaging these conversations is another way. The government has to do their part in, in making sure that we empower students in these times. But then I would say, citizens of Nigeria as well, we need to stand up and just take the future of our country in our own hands at this time. All right, uh, 
Shireen is still there. I, I, I thank you for still being there. You have had the conversations around in comparing the reality with Nigeria. Uh, speaking about education, what's your thoughts finally before we wrap this segment with the three of you? You mean globally? Is yes. That, is that... Yes, education globally. Well, I think it's when you look at because I was I was uh, because of this talk I was looking at some of the GDPR GDP stuff that goes on and how much is spent in education, and I was really surprised that um, Nigeria. Well, I wasn't really surprised. I have to say, Nigeria and Pakistan are one of the countries that spend the lowest in education, which was which is really shocking because India is one and India has been coming up with their education and the literacy rates. So I think education is very important because it is about empowerment. It is about giving people control. It is about making informed decisions about stuff. And, and I think children are the future of the nation. And I agree with Grace that I think people have to take action themselves because if the world leaders are not doing something about it, then I think we, as like I said, the common person has to stand up and say, hold them responsible and ask them the question, you know, why are you not doing this? Why can you spend, why are you spending so much more money on arms, for example, on weapons, but why not on these children? Like, I'm, I'm really shocked, like, 100 students in a classroom. Mm. That, that is just incredible. I mean, how can anyone learn that way? I mean, in the UK, I mean, the, in state schools, there, I think there's 30 children in a class, mm. I would say. But then also, they have, like, an, like a teaching assistant there, which right. helps out. But still, people make, you know, say it's too many in a class. And now it's become reduced. But this about giving people technology, and I was wondering when you mentioned technology, and I was thinking, why is it that they're not given the technology? All right, what? Shirin, uh, I'm afraid yes, that's Shirin. all we can take in the interest of time. Thank you so very much, Shirin No, for your uh, contributions there. And of course, to Chinenye uh, Mba Uzouku and Grace Amoka. From all that you have said, we have, I mean, evidence based from the figures and data that you release that we have a way to, we have to move forward in our education sector in Nigeria. Thank you to the three of you for your incredible uh, contributions there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank all you right. for having me. Thank you.